Um, you might be expecting a prism as a service, not subject to American law, which I'm still giving. I just um, added more, and um, it's prettier, and it's going to be more fun. So, um, so the new title of this, same content, more stuff, um, how to spy with Python, so easy the NSA can do it. So I am, let's see, does this even work? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So I'm Lynn Root, um, Rogue Lynn on the interwebs, and this presentation um, you can find it at rogue.ly slash spy. And yeah, that is my real last name. <laughs> I guess um, I'll start off with a tiny little joke. I've never done jokes before, but um, my father, he's a, a software engineer. Um, he uh, graduated high school, went straight into uh, the Air Force, and uh, he was doing like computer science-y stuff in the Air Force, and they're like, oh, look, you're already in the system. We don't have to give you a username. So they let him run with root. <laughs> All right, so who am I? Um, I work for Spotify, I'm what's called a partner engineer. Um, it's kind of like a back-end engineer meets like a developer advocate, meets like just integrating with um, third-party partners to like use our apps and stuff. A lot of API building and uh, API like systems running. Um, mostly Python, some Java. Um, I run the Pi Ladies of San Francisco. Um, it's actually, Pilates started out here um, in LA about mm, three years ago or so. Wow, it's so long. And um, Pilates of San Francisco has been around about two and a half years. Um, so it's really fun. It's for women in Python, but it's also, it's for everyone, but we, we promote women. Um, and I'm also the board, um, on the board of the Python Software Foundation. So I'm kind of all about Python, if you haven't noticed. Um, so the obligatory disclaimer that I must say, um, I am not affiliated with the NSA, FBI, CAA, or anything like that, any alphabet soup. Um, I am not a lawyer, <laughs> nor am I a black or white hat. <laughs> and this is just a proof of concept. There's no warranty, no promises, no anything. <laughs> um, so my talk today, um, I'm going to go over historical context of um, kind of what the NSA has done before and bring us up to the now, what they're doing right now um, with PRISM and with X Keyscore. Um, that leads us to a lot of unanswered questions that I'm sure a lot of you folks have. And then um, how you can do it, because it's, it's fun and it's easy. <laughs> All right, so what this talk is not. It is not condoning what the NSA is doing. It is not um, how to uh, avoid being tracked by the NSA. Um, is not encouraging you how to spy on your friends or family or anywhere where there's free Wi-Fi. All right, so we'll start off with a historical context. The uh, TLDR, basically what the NSA is doing with PRISM is nothing new. Um, so starting in actually uh, 1946, we have the Five Eyes group, you might be familiar. Um, it was comprised of USA, the UK, uh, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, they uh, want to, or they share intelligence, especially signal intelligence, um, and each country would surveil a set of countries, um, like the U.S. would focus on Latin America and share it with Canada. Um, but there's no sort of um, law against or rule against Canada spying on the U.S. and sharing the data with the U.S. I'm sure, I mean, they say that we don't spy on our own citizens, but you can still get around it. And so what, um, actually, sorry. Um, Next thing. Uh, in 1952, the NSA was established. Originally, it started in 1917, right after um, the U.S. declared war on Germany. Um, it morphed into the um, Armed Forces Security Agency after uh, World War II. And then sort of um, the AFSA couldn't really get its shit together, so um, it's, it's restarted or rebranded itself with the NSA in 1952. Over 20 years after the NSA form was formally established and after 50 years of starting U.S. surveillance, um, the Supreme Court finally uh, required warrants for domestic surveillance. Um, in 1978, five years afterwards, the Senate's Church Committee revealed illegal domestic spying by the NSA in 1975 with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act um, um, being assigned into law. There's also the secret court that was established, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and was created for the purpose of hearing those warrant requests that were required. 
In 2001, um, after 9-11, there was a culture shift, at, at least publicly with the NSA, perhaps privately, they're always for uh, domestic spying, but at least publicly, they're um, more, uh, more towards it. Um, so within the first month after September 11th, the White House asks the NSA what more could be done against terrorism if it had more power. Um, the NSA resur resurfaces a plan, um, originally de uh, deemed illegal in 1999 to do um, to collect or uh, contact uh, chaining uh, to chain contact data um, for, with metadata, sorry, and um, the U.S. president uh, gives authority for the NSA to do just that and to begin targeting the terrorist-associated foreign phone numbers. Still within that first month, um, the, U uh, the U.S. president and the cabinet sort of scramble together because they realize that there was domestic spying pr like going on, but it wasn't legal yet, and so they had to create an authorization to do that. So the uh, Bush signs that order to allow domestic spying, and um, now the NSA feels that it's allowed to spy on U.S. calls and emails. Now, of course, the U.S. Attorney General um, was just told to just, just sign it, just, uh, just go ahead and sign it without even reading it, and the general counsel of the NSA um, deems it legal. Shortly after, um, unrevealed telecoms and Internet providers in the U.S. received letters from the NSA requesting data um, and support for its domestic spying program. And then one AT&T employee discovers the NSA working inside um, of its uh, uh, San Francisco facilities. And then now telecom, telecoms formally enter, enter into a voluntary agreement uh, with uh, US to give data to the NSA. Voluntary. <laughs> And then um, there's this installation of special technology in a super secret room, room number uh, 641A at uh, AT&T's SF facility. And it was to read and analyze tens of thousands of communications per second and then send that communications to a central database. 2003, we have the total information awareness. Uh, the program started in 2003, but it started actually being developed in 2000. And it's aimed to gather detailed information about individuals to anticipate and prevent crimes. And they do a lot of data sharing within the FBI and CIA as well. Um, Congress stops it, supposedly, but then it just kind of quietly moves under the NSA's domestic spying program. All right, so um, 2005, the New York Times reveals that the NSA has been spying on Americans um, without warrants. And soon after, Bush confirms the warrantless eavesdropping. The New York Times also reveals that some of the NSA's spying is purely domestic with some telecoms giving backdoor access to communication streams. And soon after, the New York Times articles, um, an unknown company requested the NSA um, to issue court orders rather than companies voluntarily giving um, data. So only after that they were publicly released did um, telecoms go in the reactionary and say, now you need a warrant. 2007, the Protect America Act was passed and allowed the NSA to not need those warrants for collecting communication. All right, so then um, September 2007, uh, data collection for PRISM starts with Microsoft. Um, 2008, um, U.S. Congress passed amendments to the FISA um, that gives telecoms immunity, legal immunity for those that cooperated with NSA. 2012, the NSA now starts to build its biggest spy center in Utah for the collection and intercept of intercepted data. And um, 2012, the FBI also pushes for wiretap-ready uh, websites, asking internet companies to not oppose a law making backdoors mandatory. 2013, um, we all remember that um, the Washington Post exposes the PRISM program, and then shortly after, the X-Keyscore program was revealed. Okay, so then, now we're at the now, what exactly is the NSA doing? First off, what is PRISM? PRISM stands for uh, Planning Tool for Resource Integration, Synchronization, and Management. It's a mouthful of words that don't really, we don't really know, we don't really understand when all put together. So it, what it does, it mines electronic data for the purpose of mass surveillance. Collects intelligence that pass through the US servers, and I'm sure uh, you know that um, a lot of the internet traffic passes through the US, even if it's just purely in Europe. And it targets foreigners, but it's very elusive about the data that it gets or accidentally gets on uh, U.S. citizens, and it supposedly only collects metadata. 
Now, what is X key score? It's a digital network intelligence exploitation system, another mouthful uh, word. Um, it's a federated query system of completely unfiltered data. As of 2008, I only had up to about 700 servers, which isn't a lot, but um, as I mentioned earlier, 2012, they built that big spy center in Utah, so I'm sure they have tons more. And it gives the, the NSA users the ability um, to query for email addresses, a target's activity, phone numbers, HTTP traffic, extract file attachments, etc. All right, and so that leaves us with some unanswered questions. All of this is public knowledge. All of this was revealed in newspapers, and um, the EFF had, does a really good job um, chaining everything together. Um, but now, where does that leave us? So, what does metadata actually mean? And how do companies not notice being doored, or are they just lying um, when denying cooperation? And how is the target's foreignness determined? How exactly um, are they identifying non-U.S. citizens? And what is done with data that accidentally is collected on Americans? Um, how is PRISM collected data handled by the NSA? Does the NSA maintain rigorous security uh, measures to protect against threats? So can they get, they have my data by accident, can someone else get it through some other secret door that the NSA is not aware of? <laughs> um, and so I actually, this next slide, the few bullet points are taken from the EFS presentation at 33C in Berlin this uh, past month. Um, and it's about like why metadata matters and what it is. So they know you rang a sex phone service at 2.24 a.m. and spoke for 18 minutes, but they don't know what you talked about. They know that you called um, the suicide prevention hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge, um, but they don't know, that, but the topic of the call remains secret. They know you spoke with an HIV testing service, then your doctor, then your health insurance company in the same hour, but they don't know what was discussed. So that's just to illustrate how important metadata is. They might not know the actual content of the conversation, but they can glean a lot of information just from metadata. All right, now kind of how the NSA is doing it, presumably. So it's through the tier one, the backbone of the internet. The tier one internet allows vast swaths of data to flow from one endpoint to another in the simplest pass versus um, consumer internet, which hops looking for the cheapest path. Uh, major companies like Google, Facebook, etc., are able to tap in the, ear, the uh, tier one network through entry points called edges. And then rather than walking into Google or Facebook's data centers and be noticed, the NSA actually just wiretaps these edges between major companies and the tier one network. And you might be asking, what about like a TLS SSL encryption? Well, who's to say that they're not just calling up like uh, certificate authorities and getting you know, access to private keys? Or you know, trying to decrypt it themselves. <laughs> so it's actually probably like this. I don't know if you can see that, but <laughs> in the first comic, it's um, saying we're going to build this big machine to try and decrypt a 4,096-bit RSA key, and what actually happens is just brute force of knocking someone over and trying to get the password out of them. So NSA has a lot of power. So <laughs> the point is that they have the data. How they got the data it doesn't really matter anymore. Okay. So now comes the fun part. I scared you all by what the NSA is doing, what they can do, and now it's how you can do it. Um, so um, I should have brought my little mask and stuff, but we're supposed to, you know, like, be a hacker, right? And that's how the uh, media <laughs> thinks a hacker looks like. So if you happen to have one of those things, maybe I can borrow it for the rest of the presentation. Anyways, <laughs> so, uh, tools use, um, this is IPython, this whole presentation is written in IPython and is rendered with a reveal.js. Um, I use Scapy for packet sniffing and manipulation, um, PyGeoIP, which is an API for uh, GeoIP databases, and then GeoJSON, uh, bindings and utilities for GeoJSON. Um, and then last but not least, Python nmap, it's a wrapper around nmap port scanner. And if you want to play along, if you happen to have a computer or anything, um, this presentation is just, just, just at rogue.ly slash spy. But then the complete notebook uh, is you know, spy-notebook. And then I do a quick introduction to Scapy. And then um, all the queries, the individual queries, are spy-number like of query. 
And then um, the whole repository of the notebooks can be found at just slash spy dash repo. Really, you only need this first link because then you can find the links associated with that. All right, all the fun stuff. A quick introduction to Scapy. And so if you're a Pythonista, um, you are cringing at this because it import star just is really bad like <laughs> programming technique, I guess. But um, to, to get started with Scapy, you import from star, um, and this is how you sniff. It's just um, you specify the interface that you want to sniff on. Um, you filter for TCP data over port 80, so just TCP, um, HTTP traffic. And we're only limiting to uh, 10 packets. And so I'm sniffing and I got 10 packets. You can see 10 TCP uh, packets right there. And if I look at what it gave me, it's pretty much a barf of information. You can't really make sense of it all. It's just too much. So if we just look into the first packet, um, it's a little bit more bite-sized for us. Um, and then if we uh, use scapies.show function, um, it's actually a little bit prettier. So you can see that the Ethernet um, layer, the IP layer, and then scrolling down the TCP layer. Um, all right, so that was all that we're really going to use with Scapy. It's actually really simple. So the following queries that I'm going to go over, these are actually queries that were presented to NSA employees before this presentation got exposed by, um, by Washington Post. Um, so the language of the queries are exactly from um, their own presentation. I just prettied up the slides because the NSA does not know how to use like Keynote or something like that. Um, and these queries are they're just a proof of concept. We're not like storing any data unlike the NSA. And once again, I'm not condoning you to spy on your friends or family or anywhere where there's free Wi-Fi. <laughs> All right, so the first, first query, uh, show me everyone that has searched for a Y term. So we're going to, um, I have a PCAP file from earlier, and I'm going to use uh, Scapy's offline capabilities of sniffing. You can also just um, sniff actively and then save it for later. Um, notice that I'm using Yahoo uh, rather than Google, because Google now um, encrypts all of its traffic over HTTPS, and Yahoo does not. And I'm limiting it to uh, 300 packets. So if you look at what the packets give us, I still have 300 TCP packets. And if we get a summary of it, we can just get pretty much a dump of everything. So the first one goes from ether to IP to TCP, from IP, um, from that destination port to the um, IP, uh, this, well, yeah, from and then to the IP, and you can see the syn and synax and, and the raw flags. Um, if we just pick one packet in particular, I'm picking number 79, and we get that um, pretty little packet printing. If we scroll down a little bit, you can see what's actually kind of gets interesting for us is the raw load of the packet. I'll go into that a little bit better, but you can kind of see like um, maybe some headers, the HTTP, the host headers. Um, Let's see, stuff that looks familiar to us, the user agent. We can see the get request of the actual URL. Uh, is just so much fun. So the next one, if we just wanted to get the raw layer, we get that part. Now we've got to parse it a little bit. Um, I know that Yahoo's, all, all Yahoo's queries are right after question mark P equals. So I'm just parsing that out. And anything after the ampersand is, is not, not what I need. So I can see that my first traffic, my first query was Madrid when I was sniffing uh, traffic. And then the second query uh, was I love chocolate, because they do. And then the third query was blue bottle coffee that I misspelled when I was sniffing my own traffic. So you can see that it's really easy to pick, on, pick up what you're, you're searching for. Um, of course, I did it with my own traffic because I don't want to be like nefarious. I don't want to like snoop on other people. But it's extremely easy to do that in open Wi-Fi networks. All right, next query. Show me um, everyone from X country that has visited Y extremist forum. So we're um, importing Scapy again. We're using um, a PCAP file that I already have. Getting um, 41 TCP packets, two UDP packets, and looks like all. And then we're picking up um, packet number three and get another, um, another pretty printed one. You can see some, um, the raw data again. Um, so the raw data um, looks familiar. 
uh, and all you basically have to do is like is that in, like is that host name within the search query, or you could um, you could actually put that in your uh, sniffer um, filter itself, just that host. Like, is this person visiting, or is is any traffic visiting this particular host? And so um, I hope you can see it all. This is just a quick and dirty like trace route function of all the IP address hops um, that uh, it takes to get to um, the host um, that I'm targeting. Um, and I get all these IP addresses. And then quickly um, geomapping this, trying to get the from IP address to uh, the coordinates, um, latitude and longitude coordinates. And you can see I have a, a bunch of tuples there. Now I'm using GeoJSON to um, create a, like a GeoJSON file. And I get this um, JSON looking um, blob of data. <laughs> and then if you use GitHub to actually plot, um, you just throw this up on GitHub and you can actually see all the traffic mapped out. So you can see that probably started, I was in Sweden at this time, so the um, traffic started in Sweden, um, ended up I think in Kansas, and then back to the U, um, UK or something, and then over to San Francisco, and then at some point got back to me. So that, that's pretty interesting. So you can actually uh, geoplot like the whole movements of where I initiated the like request to visit a site and the hops that it took to get there. All right, so on to query number three. Give me all emails with X in the body of the email. So I have an SMTP uh, PCAP file, just a different filtering. And you can see from the summary, um, the first line you can see mail.patriots.in. Uh, that kind of looks like a, a mail um, packet. And then we have SMTP traffic as well as some other, um, some other flags. Oops, and then um, we're going to look at packet number 11. Um, and if we just get the raw, we can see it looks encoded. Um, I just want to get rid of the null characters. So then um, let's see if we can decode it. And it looks like it was an email address. Now the next packet, I'm curious. Um, this is another encoded string. It happens to be a password like prompt. And so the following packet is the, what do you think it'll be? Password. <laughs> uh, this was uh, taken uh, from a PCAP file that someone put up online, so he's well aware that his password is out there, and I'm sure he has since changed his password, I am hoping. Um, but that's, that's easily available. So then um, I made another little um, kind of query um, so I can see that if this particular email has the word attachment in it. And um, query found. So you can see um, the whole email in plain text, even though it was sent with SMTP. Um, and you can see like the attachment um, name in there, or the word in there. And if you kind of scroll a little bit down further, you can actually see the attachment. This is the attachment plain text. So a little bit of packet sniffing can actually pick up the attachment of the email. All right. Now, query number four. Give me a PGP usage from a certain country. Um, I have a PGP email that um, I was playing around with, and so I'm just opening it up. I'm reading it, and um, here is um, the PGP email that um, you would otherwise see in your mail client. Notice that all the headers are not encrypted, um, only the body of the email is, which is here. So you're still able to see like who it was from, who it was to, like the routes it took, as well as what um, kind, like what version of like PGP I'm using and uh, like what client for GPG and PGP. Um, so then you could just do like a little, you, could, you have to search for this protocol equals application slash PGP encrypted and bam, I am easily able to tell that it was encrypted with PGP. And then so now I want to know where this went, where this came from. So again, I'm plotting all the IP addresses to um, latitude and longitude. And, um, it started off in Germany and it kind of bounced around. I was in San Francisco at that time, so you can see that um, 
you can see all the hops that it goes. I mean, even though that I was not in like, I think that's um, Switzerland or maybe an up in the UK, even though I wasn't there, there's still like um, hops there. So if like Switzerland had like a spy on everyone like uh, regime, <laughs> it could, um, it, like traffic would uh, still be probably sniffed by them. So this is, uh, this is just to illustrate that a lot of traffic goes everywhere, even if it's just directly between one point and another and doesn't hit like Switzerland or something like that. All right, so uh, query number five, show me chat for a certain user during a certain time frame. Um, so I have this um, IRC Skype cap file, and I have a lot of packets. Um, and then we can see that it goes over port 6667, and uh, we have a free node host name, so this looks like um, um, IRC. Um, and doing a little pretty printing sprint F stuff, you can see, start to see some conversations going on, especially down here. You got some unencrypted ones. There you go. So it's easy to pick up or um, see plain text uh, chats over IRC. We're doing um, some filtering because that was a lot of information. And I'm particularly filtering for the user um, Amaric. And you can see sort of the private messages um, between Amaric and Yalloki um, at the beginning. So you can see this whole conversation. That's kind of scary. But, I mean, what do you expect with IRC? <laughs> all right, so the final one. I find all exploitable machines in Z country. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to exploit or what is exploitable, but I'm going to show you how you can find machines that could be exploitable. So we're using a Python's Nmap wrapper. And I'm just going to scan Bitbucket over port 22 to 443. And um, I get this information. You can see that the first line is the actual command line if you're, to running, if you're running it in bash. And then you can see on port 25 that it's an SMTP port. You can also see that on port 53 is bind and that particular version. And then port 80. You can see that Nginx 1.5.3. Um, now, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any exploitations. Like, I don't pay attention to that stuff. But um, if, like, um, if there is an exploitation against, like, Nginx, you can easily, a particular version, you can easily, like, all right, well, that's uh, vulnerable, so let me try and exploit that. I know there's a lot of um, exploits against Apache, and if they didn't update their Apache installation, it'd be really easy to um, exploit that, too. Um, and so I'm just taking this particular host, this IP address. Um, again, I'm plotting it against a geo um, JSON, or getting the latitude and longitude and getting the geo JSON for that latitude and longitude. And it's just one particular like point. You can see that this particular bit bucket host is, um, if it zooms out a little bit more, it's near Boulder. Oh yeah, there we go, Denver. So this particular host is in Denver. All right, so we went over six queries. Now we're going to wrap it up a little bit. Um, so there's a long historical precedence for mass surveillance um, with very little oversight or restriction. And you can see that this is nothing new that we explored. Um, safe to assume that the NSA is pretty much spying on everyone, even its own US citizens. Um, made a con quick conjecture of how the NSA is actively backdooring communications. Um, kind of sort of how to get yourself on the no-fly list, but not really. Um, and how to implement your own sort of toy prism and X key score in Python. Now that went a lot quicker than I originally planned, but um, that is it. And um, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm here for questions too.